With that said, we're going to start here in chapter 8. I'll read verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to give you a review. <coughs> Excuse me. I, oh, I'll be uh, at the door hugging people when you leave. <laughs> if you want to get out of work. <laughs> Reading uh, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and get, getting into our introduction. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he, had, how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he, had get, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So let me give you a review, because we're going to be closing the book today. Um, Haman's plot to destroy the Jews had been revealed. Remember, out of petty spite, Haman had plotted to destroy all the Jews. Now, this wasn't just the Jews in Persia. These were Jews anywhere that they might be found. We saw in chapter 3, verse 13, how it says that messengers went throughout all the king's provinces with orders to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. The order was complete annihilation. Now, remember when the request was made that Haman had left the people unnamed. He didn't say that this people that was, in his words, causing problems to, to the king. He didn't say that it was the Jews. You see, he, he later knew that Mordecai was Jewish. That's really all that he needed. Now, it's amazing how evil this man was. He wanted to destroy not just somebody that he was angry with, but he wanted to kill his entire people. Now, he had this high estimation of himself, and this warns us against that kind of attitude. Like it says in Psalm 36, 1 through 3, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful, they fail to act wisely or to do good. And so the order was one of complete annihilation. We want to destroy all of the Jews. Obviously, we know that's not the only time this, this sentiment has been uh, enacted. We know that hey, Hitler, not that long ago, really, uh, in our history, uh, wanted to destroy, to annihilate all the Jews. But before we think that this only happened uh, once or twice, we need to remember that this has happened even in recent times. Um, we're hearing a lot about Hamas and, and all that's going on there in Israel. Let me read to you from uh, the covenant. It's called the Hamas Covenant. It was originally issued on August 18th in 1988, and it outlines the founding identity, stand, and aims of Hamas. The original charter declares its members to be Muslims who fear God and raise the banner of jihad in the face of the oppressors. The charter states, our struggle against the Jews is very great and very serious and calls for the obliteration of Israel. It emphasizes the importance of jihad, stating in Article 13, there is no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad, initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are all a waste of time and vain endeavors. So what's going on right now is very similar in spirit to what took place with Hitler and what has taken place in history all the way back as we're looking today at the book of Esther. Now, some of you have seen the news. I'm not going to stay on this. I'm making a point. But some of you have seen in the news that these, there are people who are in, mostly in colleges, many college people, are carrying banners, and it says, from the river to the sea. Uh, they're speaking of the River Jordan to the Mediterranean, which makes up all of Israel. And what they're asking for is to obliterate the nation of Israel. There are those who are apologists. I heard one recently who was claiming that's not what they meant. No, that's what it is according to the charter. They want to obliterate annihilate, destroy, and kill all Jews. That took place in the time of Esther, took place in the time of Hitler. It's taking place in our day. 
And so that's what's taking place. A mass, uh, rather, Haman's desire was to kill all the Jews. Why? Well, he couldn't stand the fact that Mordecai would not honor him. It says in Esther chapter 5, verse 9, when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Now, Esther had been informed that Haman had planned on killing all Jews. And Mordecai forfeit her life. So when the king's command was issued and ratified, it couldn't be changed. And that command had been sent out and had been raised of a Persian king were unchangeable because he was thought to speak for the gods who could never be wrong and thus never needed to change their minds. We saw an example of that in the book of Daniel in chapter 6, verse 8, when the king was asked, uh, a request is made of the king. It says, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not change. So, Haman knew that if he could get a decree to annihilate all the Jews, that he couldn't change his mind, that the king would not change his mind. So Mordecai had told Esther that deliverance was going to arise, and it would arise for the Jews. And we saw in chapter 4, verse 14, how he said, Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So Esther knew that appearing before the king without invitation was dangerous, but she took the chance, and as we saw, her husband welcomed her and listened to her. She had devised a plan, and she wanted to get his approval. So she decided to give her husband a banquet, and she issued an invitation for Haman. Now, this is something that appealed to Haman's ego. He was thrilled about it. So he rushed home to tell his friends and his family that he'd been invited to a banquet. Now, this was a very extremely high honor. But he was passing by Mordecai, and Mordecai didn't stand or tremble before him. He didn't give him the respect he desired, and it ruined everything for him. So Haman told his friends and told his wife how much he hated Mordecai. So his wife, Zeresh, gave him advice. She said, build him a gallows and hang him on it. Thank you, sweetheart. I'll do that in the morning. <laughs> she was saying the king respects you. So suggest to him that Mordecai should die on it. Well, as we have already seen, the advice pleased Haman. And he had the gallows made to hang Mordecai. He attended the banquet and he was going to make his request to the king. Now, Esther was well aware of the plan to exterminate all the Jews. Mordecai was her cousin and he had told her, not to reveal that she was Jewish. That means that Haman did not realize that she was Jewish. Now, Esther had asked her husband to grant her a request, and he told her she could have anything she asked, to, asked for, even up to half of the kingdom. Well, she finally made a request, and when she made that request, he was stunned. Esther, had, in chapter 7, in verse 3, following, it says that Queen Esther answered and said, if I found favor in your sight, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, killed, to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male or female slaves, I would have held my tongue. Although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, who is he? And where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Imagine how he felt at that point. He's just lounging around thinking he's very cool, very important. And then she just, we used to say, dropped the dime. She dropped a dime on him and that was it. What did she say? Let my life be given to me at my petition, as well as the life of my people. Well, Esther informs her husband, it's Haman. Haman has instigated Jewish genocide. We already saw how the king was so furious, he left the room to cool off. And while out of the room, Haman had begun begging for his life, and he fell on the couch that Esther was on. It appeared that he was attempting to uh, physically abuse her. When the king came in, he saw Haman, and that was the end of Haman. 
Ahasuerus ordered Haman to be put to death. In the book of Job, in chapter 18, verse 5, it says, The light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. So that brings us here to chapter 8. And in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, as I just read, uh, those verses open with Haman's property being disposed of. Now, scripture says that Ahasuerus gave Esther the house of Haman. Now, that was to compensate, for her, uh, compensate her for the fear that she had been enduring all this time. You see, in Persia, when a criminal was executed, his property was forfeited to the king. And the king could give it to whomever he wanted. So he gave, his, he gave Haman's property to Esther. Now, in verse 1, I'll read again. It says, On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came in before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So she finally has revealed that she's a Jewess and also reveals that Mordecai is her cousin. So, verse 2, the king took off his signet ring, which he had, given, he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Ahasuerus had given his signet ring to Haman in chapter 3, verse 10. He now gives Haman's authority to Mordecai. That made him a high official in the uh, empire. He became what would be called today a prime minister. Now, remember, he's already earned the trust of the king. He had exposed a plot to assassinate him. And so he's already trustworthy to him. And so Esther gave Mordecai stewardship over the house. She didn't give him ownership, but she gave him responsibility as a steward over that house. So verse 3 says, Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman, the Agagite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. So she used a, a nuclear-style weapon against her husband. She cried. <laughs> it works every time. And so as a result of that, in making this very heartfelt plea, verse 4, the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. Esther arose and stood before the king. So the scepter is offered as a symbol of demonstrating a favor to her. And so she begins to speak in verse 5 and says, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I'm pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, Agite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. Counterman Haman's evil order to annihilate all the Jews everywhere. It's interesting that though Haman was dead, the order was still in place. Just because the people who established that law died doesn't mean the law is not still in force. That happens to this day. A bad law is passed, and the ones who initiated that law have died, but it remains in force. And so that's what was taking place. So you need to do something, she's saying. We need you to, to stop that evil law. She says in verse 6, For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? This isn't just oppression. This isn't simply persecution. We can handle that. What we're looking at here in verse 6 is complete annihilation. All of my people, destruction of all of my countrymen, and by implication... The death of all the Jews would include her and Mordecai. And so I'm asking for you to save my people, but that includes us, those you have shown favor to. Well, verse 7, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and, and they've hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name. And seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So he's saying, I've already executed Haman. That shows that I will protect you. So you can write a, a, a decree concerning the Jews. You see, I can't change this decree. 
but I grant permission to any plan that you may have to, to safeguard them. So you write the order. Once again, I can't revoke my decree. They're binding. So surely you can devise a way to save them in a way that does not shame me and fits within the law. So, verse 9. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is uh, the month of Svan, on the 23rd day. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. Now, this was over two months after the first order had been issued. While aware of the decree, the Jews would have been humbled. They would have been in prayer. So, he writes, verse 10, he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, he sealed it with the king's signet ring, sent, it, uh, sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. So they took the fastest form of transportation and they delivered this message. Well, verse 11, by these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. On one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. And so the Jews are given permission here to protect themselves. Now notice with me, they were not given permission to take the offensive. They were not given a command, go out and attack your enemies. They were <laughs> given permission to defend themselves. They were also given permission to plunder those who were attempting to kill them. So all the people had been made aware of this, and they were now prepared. Now, it says in verse 15, Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, with a great crown of gold, a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And so Mordecai is arrayed as a great Persian prince. As he's walking out, he's, he's just looking amazing. He is great in honor. Now, he's not equal in status, obviously, to the king. But he was arrayed in very beautiful clothes. And, and it caused everybody to be, to be rejoicing. Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. The tables have turned. Instead of afraid, being afraid, and they had been, because they knew that an issue had, uh, an order had gone out. They knew they were going to be slaughtered. But now they're filled with joy because their fear has been replaced with it. And they're rejoicing. Like it says in Psalm 97, 11, light is sown for the righteous, gladness for the upright in heart. Psalm 112, verse 4, even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. So they, they're filled with, with uh, light spirits, gladness, joy, joy and gladness, feast and holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. The Jews had been trembling. But the people in the land are now afraid. Perhaps their anti-Semitism had been voiced out loud. And now they're in fear. Now I want you to see something. Notice how they became, many became Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. That's pretty... That's, that's a statement that, that we Christians wouldn't really understand very deeply because it, it, it's more, it was more than simply saying, okay, I'm a Jew. They had to go through particular rites, including circumcision. And the idea that they would go that far tells you how f afraid they were and how much they wanted to be in the favor of the God of Israel. They submitted even to that. 
The Bible in, in Psalm 18, 40, 43 says, You have delivered me from the attacks of the people. You have made me the head of nations. People I did not know now serve me. And so things are going pretty good. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and, and his decree to be executed. On, on the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. So the day decreed that was to have set the people upon the Jews, well, the day has come now that the Jews have defended themselves and they're victorious. Um, the people are not conquering the Jews. The Jews are now conquering their enemies. They thought they were going to exterminate the Jews. It didn't happen. Instead, the Jews defended themselves and are victorious. Psalm 41:11. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. So, in verse 2, the Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And uh, no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. So the laying hands on them, but not the way Christians do. They're killing them. Sometimes we want to do that, but that'll be a different study some other day. And this is interesting. It's pointing out to us that they took advantage of their freedom to fight, and they fought valiantly. Now, they fought this way because their nation, their lives were at stake. And like is true in every, every military man understands this, military woman would understand this. They were fighting not only for their own lives. They were fighting for the lives of their wives, for their children, for their cities, and for their nation. And that's part of what is a just, a, a just war is fighting in that way. They're fighting to protect themselves, but they're also fighting with a cause. And the cause was to protect their children, to protect their, their wives, and to protect the cities, to protect their nation. And they're fighting against those who sought their harm. And no one could withstand them. And notice that God provoked these people to fear. They became afraid. Verse 2, it says, fear of them fell upon all the people. As I was preparing the study, I was thinking of, of the book of Joshua. <clears throat> How that in the book of Joshua, when the, uh, the Jews sent a couple of two spies into uh, Jericho. And as they went in, there was a woman there by the name of Rahab. And she's referred to, to us in scripture as Rahab the harlot. And these men had come in. We know the story. They had come in, and there was an order that, uh, because they had heard that there were uh, foreigners had entered in, there was an order uh, for them to be turned in. And so they began looking for these two spies, and, and they couldn't find them. Um, Rahab had taken these two Jewish spies and had hidden them in her attic. Well, the king ordered her to bring out these men, but she said, well, they've already gone. And then, when everything was clearing up for a moment, she spoke to the spies in Joshua 2, 9 through 11. And she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the, key, of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. And when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. Everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. And so this word had come and it had caused fear. Well, it's doing the same thing here. Fear fell on all of these people in verse 2. Well, verse 3, all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, all those doing the king's work, helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai Alice and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became increasingly prominent 
So all government officials are now helping because of his position. They're afraid not to support him or his people. And this is how it often happens. People don't do what is right, but what is expedient for them. They didn't side necessarily with the Jews. They were simply afraid of retribution from Mordecai. He was powerful, powerful due to his relationship with the king and powerful due to his relationship with Esther. And so, verse 5, thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what, what they pleased with those who hated them. So what they did is they retaliated against their enemies who had tried to kill them. <laughs> verse 6, in Shushan the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, verse 7, Parsh, here we go. Also, Philip and George and Bill and Mike and Terry and Craig. Here we go. Let's try and pronounce these words. Also, Parshandatha, Dolphin, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Eridatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aridai, Fred, <laughs> and Vajas. Vajazatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. They didn't plunder Shushan because personal enrichment was not their goal. Verses 7 through 10 are actually giving us the, the names of the ten sons of Haman. And so these are the ones whom they killed. Again, notice in verse 10, they didn't lay hand on the plunder. This all came under Esther's ownership and Mordecai's stewardship. They didn't want to do that. Plus, they didn't want to be malicious, and they didn't want to appear greedy. Verse 11. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan the citadel was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. And so they informed the king how many have died. He would want to know how many subjects have died. And then he speaks and says in verse 12 that 500 have died and the sons of Haman are dead. Who knows how many others? Now, it may be a question, um, not so much a question, but a statement. So what else do you want? What else will please you? Well, verse 13, Esther said, if it, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the, on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan and they hanged Haman's Ten son. Now, his ten sons were already dead. What they did is they had these sharpened stakes, and they, they impaled them. And that would have been a declaration of what happens to the king's enemies. That's a very ancient tactic, by the way, because even during the time of Christ, when people were crucified, they were done so outside of the city, and they were done in a public place so that the people would walk by and see these people who had been crucified writhing. Sometimes they would last on the cross three or four days. And they would walk by hearing them writhing, screaming in pain. And it was a terrible warning to all people. If you, if you uh, commit a, a crime, this is what can happen to you. And so Esther has them posted so that the people will see. And see that as a warning that you don't come against the king. And you don't do the kinds of things that Haman was guilty of. And it was demonstrated by hanging his sons in that way. So she's saying, let's make sure the job is finished. We don't need any to survive. Which is, by the way, part of um, the original orders of the children of Israel. When they were first entering into the land, they were conquering the land. And they were given orders to show no mercy in Deuteronomy 7. Verses 1 through 3, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to possess and 
drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Seven nations larger, I won't say cellulites. Seven <laughs> nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them, show no mercy. Wipe it out. Wipe out the evil completely was the command. So finish the task. Now, undoubtedly, the leaders of their enemies were still alive. They could attempt to rally and destroy the Jews, so finish this. Hang, verse 13, hang his ten sons so that all will see and fear the king. Well, verse 15, the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. The remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives and, and, and had rest from their enemies, killed 75,000 of their enemies. That is like uh, almost filling up uh, the Colosseum or, or close to filling up the Rose Bowl. I, that's just a huge amount for us to try and get our mind around. But they killed 75,000 of their enemies. Again, they did not lay hand on the plunder. They were not doing this out of greed. They were doing this because they needed to do it. Well, verse 17. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, as well as on the 14th and on the 15th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled town celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. So that gives a general consensus or order of the things that happened. The slaughter of the enemies, enemies occurred on the 13th and the 14th, and they rested. On the 15th, they celebrated their victory as well as their survival. And after war comes a victory feast. It's been said, after work comes rest, but after escape comes joy. And so they're rejoicing. So verse 20, Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus who established among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies as the month which, which <laughs> was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from morning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another, gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted the custom which, had, which they had begun, as Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them, and had cast Pur, Pur is a lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. So they called these days Purim after the name Pur. Therefore, because of the, all the words of this letter, what they, had, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who had joined them, that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. So, they wanted their descendants to always remember and to never forget this great victory. Psalm 105, verses 4 and 5. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. Deuteronomy 32, 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father. He'll tell you. Your elders. They will explain to you. 
Psalm 77, 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your miracles of long ago. If there's anything that we need to do is we need to learn, even as they are commemorating this great victory that God had, had uh, delivered their enemies into their hands, we need to, as believers, never, never cease to remember the things God has done in our lives. There's one of the things that I think that it's very easy is to begin to live a Christian life that is so blessed that you think that that's just the way it's always been and you forget what it was like before. One of the best things that I try to do is to remember where I came from. I, I never want to forget where I was. I never want to forget what I was and the things that I did. Not with a desire to go back to those things. Those are the things God saved me from. But to remember those things. And, and we ought to have within our own hearts memorials. You know, the, the children of Israel, when they crossed over uh, the river, they, they, they had a stones of remembrance that they would they would be able to tell their children, this is where God met me in a special way. I have on, on occasion, I have driven in, in my own personal stones of memo, uh, uh, remembrance. I have driven by the, the house that, that our church began in. I've driven by the house that we began meeting on Sunday mornings. I've driven to the first little church that we rented uh, when we first began. I've gone by the other properties, the Central School in Ontario Christian Elementary and small place there on Maple Street in Ontario on, and, and uh, Ontario High School. Those are all places that I have memories. Uh, I, I drive by on occasion. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the street at the moment. For some reason, I'm, I'm not remembering the name of the street, but it's, it's, it's off of Holt just before you get to Euclid and... Uh, Anyway, I, I, my brother had an apartment in this, uh, this, this area, and, uh, and it's by a park. And on occasion, I will drive by, and I'll even pull over and just look at this little teeny, it's a small apartment. His apartment couldn't have been 600 square feet. And I'll sit there, and I'll just look at it. And my mind will just travel back uh, all these years. Back to 1974. And I'll just look at this little, I'll look up and I'll see the little, the room, the, the little apartment that, that I, I taught a Bible study there to my brother. And I have fond memories of that place because that's where I met my, my girl who became my wife in that little Bible study there. And I'll sit there and I'll look at that and, and, and I, I get sentimental over it and I'll think, oh God, look at what you have done. Never forget what the Lord has done in your life. Don't long for the days that you were lost. Don't be looking back saying, oh, I remember. At least I had something to do on Friday nights then. You know, yeah. Yeah, you had things to do. And on, and on Saturday morning, you, had, you were hung over or, or regretting what you did. Yeah, remember those things too. Remember the things that, that you, the price you paid for the false memories you had. Have sometimes we think it was such a great time. I don't forget those things. I don't forget those things. I could go into them, I, but I don't forget them. I don't forget what I did. I, I never have. It's not that I want them. It's not that I, that I even sorrow over them. God has wiped away those things from, from my heart in terms of guilt. He has set me free. He's given me the joy of salvation, you know, uh, but I don't forget. And I think it's very important that you not forget either, especially when the enemy says to you, look at you, man, what a bummer. Look at him. You, you turned out to be a real jerk, didn't you? I mean, you used to be so fun. And you said, so people were calling you up and wanting to party and hang around. And now all you do is, is nothing. Aren't you bored? Aren't you tired of being dumb? You ought to enjoy your life again. Remember? The enemy says that to me all the time. He doesn't say remember. He'll say member. <laughs> remember when you used to do that? No. It's important to keep in mind the things that God has done for you. Forgetting those things is very common. We need to be aware of that. In Jewish history, very often the people seem to forget what God had done for them. When you look in the book of Judges in chapter 2, verse 7, it, it says the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua 
and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. But it goes on in verse 10 and it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. In one generation, they forgot. In one generation, God had done so many wonderful things for them, bringing them into a promised land. And within a generation, they forgot. You might find this interesting. I'll say it briefly. Uh, the Jesus movement is very much like that. A lot of people who got saved in that era that is called the Jesus movement didn't raise their children in the ways of the Lord. And their children do not know the things that God did for their parents because the parents did not raise the children in the knowledge of the Lord. The parents got caught up with other things, a lot of things. I think there were anywhere from eight to ten people in the uh, van when I got saved. And out of the eight to ten people that were friends of mine, I only know three of us that continued with the Lord. The other six, seven people walked away a long time ago. And so this is the establishment of Purim. I'll say a couple of things and we're going to close because chapter 10 only has three verses. But Purim, we've been in Israel when they're celebrating Purim. They walk around in costumes. It, 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 we asked, uh, why are they running around dressed in, in costumes, you know? I know they don't celebrate Halloween, so what is this? And you'll see them, they're dressed up like kings or queens or things like that, you know? And uh, so uh, one, one rabbi uh, says, and I looked this up in some Jewish sources, one rabbi says, it is because the Jews pretended to be something else during the time that, uh, that, that they were going to be slaughtered. Uh, another writer said, on Purim, we wear costumes to recall that everything that happens is driven by God's guiding force, leading every event towards his master plan for his creation. It shows how God hid his work behind ordinary events. Also, another writer said, it's a day when the poor receive charity. And so it helps to minimize the embarrassment of those who are receiving charitable gifts because they give gifts. Uh, it, it minimizes their embarrassment. But to this day, they continue celebrating that particular feast. It says, finally, Queen Esther, verse 29, the daughter of Abihel, Abihel with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the uh, 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time. As Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them and as they decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. Finally, verse uh, one of chapter 10, King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. All the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews as well and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. So Queen Esther uh, established Purim. The king imposes tribute. He has a new sense of power and authority. He's increasing his revenue, revenue. And he's saying, finally, all of these things are written in the Persian history books. Mordecai used his power to encourage. And Mordecai helped to secure peaceful existence. And thus we conclude the book of Esther.